In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are continuing our teaching in What is the Eastern Orthodox Church? This is part three, so if you have not seen part one and two, refer back to my videos of part one and part two of What is the Eastern Orthodox Church? My name is Archimandrite Father Mikael. I serve as an exorcist priest in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Our church takes its autonomy from the one true Greek Orthodox Church from Alexandria. So we're continuing on here in our teaching from this pamphlet, as you can see there. So let's skip over to where I believe we left off. We'll start here with the ecumenical synods or the meaning of the conscience of the conscience of the church. Let us begin. The highest authority in the Eastern Orthodox Church is the conscience of the Ecclesia, the church. Uh, I believe we read that already. Let's let's go down to the bottom. Um, I'll read this bottom half just in case I did not. The ecumenical synods, seven in number, either adopted the truths already accepted by the consents of the church or stated that the ever existing truths of the word of God by defending them against the heretics who were attempting at that time to devastate them. These truths did not constitute a systematic statement of the entire teaching of the Orthodox faith, nor did they adopt or authorize a system of catechism. They merely defended and formulated only those truths which had been attacked and misrepresented by their pagans, by either pagans or for uh, the most part by misled Christians. Strictly speaking, the only truths of the word of God which were formulated by the ecumenical synods are those stated in the ecumenical Nicene Creed relating mainly to the Holy Trinity and especially to the second person, Jesus Christ, the Logos. See chapter on ecumenical synods. The authority and freedom in the Orthodox Church. Bishops conferring in a synod consider themselves guided by the Holy Spirit, but not to the extent of eliminating the need for their human abilities to search the sources of the revealed will of God, the bishops pronounce the interpretation of the will of God according to methods of logical procedure humanly adopted as a positive way of Christian life. The Holy Spirit prevents the entire church from false statements of a truth already revealed by God. It does not compel the church to create or invent a truth or truths. Thus, it gives the members of the synod the freedom of using their minds and abilities to decide an issue with the full understanding that they are acting as an ecumenical synod. But if a synod is not approved by the conscience of the church as such, that is, as being ecumenical, the action of the church as such, that is, as being ecumenical, the action of the synod will be abolished later by an ecumenical synod, which bears witness of the conscience of the church. Again, many local synods have been convened and have acted as such. Many personal statements have been expressed by churchmen and laymen without an assumption that these statements have been ecumenical authority. Yet assumption that yet these statements sometimes 
have been raised by the conscience of the church, conscience of the church, to the rank of a, of authoritative statements to be sanctioned later by the next ecumenical synod. If you see me messing up from time to time here, it's because I'm reading it through my phone and uh, not directly on the page with the words are pretty small. So it's hard for my eyes to focus through this uh, cell phone while I'm making these uh, videos. So please forgive me for anything that uh, I'm doing in regards to reading here. Sometimes the screen goes blurry and I have to deal with that as well. The criterion for proving that such statements are the revealed truths of God is the conscience of the entire church, which is considered infallible and the pillar and ground of truth as written in the Holy Bible, Timothy chapter three, verse 15. This criterion, this criterion, which the Eastern Orthodox Church so dearly keeps in conscience is its simple but golden rule for the interpretation of the scripture that is what is believed everywhere, always, and by all the faithful of the church. The Canons of the Orthodox Church. The church as a divine organization headed by our Lord Jesus Christ needs its leaders and rulers to carry out its functions and to achieve its destiny. The ecumenical synods, councils, besides the dogma, dogmata, the pronouncements of truths for salvation, have also issued canons, which are rules and regulations referring to orderly behavior and discipline. They determine the conditions for the administration of a church, administration of such a divine human organization, that is, the church, the relation of its members, duties of the clergymen, etc. These canons are decided by a majority vote and are compulsory to all the faithful, clergymen as well as laymen. However, they may be changed by the same authority which issued them. See chapter on ecumenical synods. We'll, we can go back to that at some point in time. The democratic type of administration. In the Eastern Orthodox Church, the formulation of our truths of faith and her type of government are by the people and for the people. Even its highest leader, the ecumenical patriarch in Constantinople, is considered the first among equals and each bishop as the executor and overseer for application of the truths and rules of the church. The bishop is not a ruler or a head, but a shepherd and spiritual leader. The church as a divine human organization has its instruments of action, and first the ecumenical synod or council of the church is composed of clergymen having the privilege and duty to formulate its truths of faith and to issue rules for its effective leadership. Secondly, the conscience of the church. The church as a whole approves this for formulation of truths of faith by accepting and applying them in the life of the faithful. Finally, the clergy oversee the right application of these accepted truths and rules, preaching and developing them among the faithful. The position of the layman in the church. That would be all who are baptized and chrismated in the church, but do not serve as clergy. They are laymen. The laymen constitute the royal priesthood. As members of the mystical body of Christ, although they have never replaced the special order of priesthood, the clergymen administer the divine sacrifice, although the layman has the right to administer the divine word, 
along with the priest as preacher and teacher of the gospel. Both follow and obey the teachings of the Eastern Orthodox Church. So no lay person is uh, going to be bearing false witness, uh, teaching something that is not Orthodox. If a lay person teaches something that is not Orthodox, not historically Orthodox, then uh, it is not from the church, from the uh, body of Christ. So if someone comes and says they're a Christian and they're not teaching things from the Orthodox Church, then we don't pay any attention to them, such as heretics and the heterodox. We pay no attention to them. Most of the theological uh, teachers of the clergy in some of the Orthodox countries are laymen uh, who also teach religious courses in their regular schools of those countries. The privileges and obligations of the laymen are no less than those of the clergymen, and they have the right to elect the clergymen in their community who must meet certain qualifications without his election as priest of the community. No faithful can be ordained by the bishop. So they have the right to elect the clergymen in their community who must meet certain qualifications without his election as priest of the community. No faithful can be ordained by the bishop. Although the bishop has the right to ordain unmarried male Christians and monks, the political authorities in the Orthodox countries as the sovereign power of the nation exercise their authority to sustain order, issuing, suing on some occasions the decisions of the nation, national synods as laws of the state. In the past, the emperors called the general assemblies of bishops, expressed their opinions, especially on matters of discipline, and accompanied the decisions of the synod with a special enactment. The decrees, the degrees of priesthood. The clergy by ordination consist of three degrees. The deacon, the presbyter, or the priest, and the bishop, episcopos. Their duties vary. The deacon assists the priest in offering the liturgy. However, only a few churches have a deacon. The presbyter is better known as priest because he offers the divine liturgy, which is the Holy Communion service. Only a priest gives the body and blood of Christ, a priest ordained by an Orthodox bishop. As pastor, because he looks after his people, and as a preacher, because he delivers the word of God, he administers the mysteria, i.e. the sacred ceremonies of the church, such as baptism, chrismation, holy matrimony, um, holy unction, and things like that. A regular layman who is uh, part of the royal priesthood, uh, not serving in the ordination of a priest, um, cannot administer uh, chrismation. He can administer baptism on, as a last resort for a dying person who wanted to accept Christ um, in a state of emergency, and that happens rarely. Uh, but a lay person can, as a member of the royal priesthood, does not serve in the capacity as an ordained priest who's ordained by the bishop uh, serving the mysteries of the church. But not that of ordination. So a priest cannot ordain someone. Only a bishop can ordain. He administers the chrism, which is the anointing oil when someone is when they're baptized, they're chrismated, they're anointed, holy chrism oil. The chrism oil is given uh, to the priest uh, by the bishop, and uh, the patriarch gives the chrism to the bishops, and the patriarch uh, takes days to make that chrism because lots of prayers and fasting are done, and there's over 15 spices in the chrism oil, 
and there's always some of the old oil that goes into the new oil and it's a whole process and uh, i think there's a youtube video on orthodox greek orthodox chrism oil how it's made uh you can search that out so the priest administers the chrism which is blessed and prepared only by bishops but is used by the priest today most eastern orthodox priests are married and that's uh not so for uh priests who are monks monks never marry the bishop performs the same duties as a priest and in addition oversees all parishes within his jurisdiction ordains the priest and deacons consecrates churches and as one of the local synod prepares the chrism, the myron, blessed oil for chrismation, confirmation. And also keep in mind that uh, when we become monks, we are tonsured uh, with into the monastic life by someone who is also a monk. Um, only a monk can make a monk. Uh, and usually that's done by the priest monk, which is known by hiero monk. That's a priest monk. And uh, no women can ever serve at the Orthodox Church altar. There are no women that serve uh, at the altar. There have been deaconess in time in history. Um, that's a rarity. But uh, it is Orthodox. There has been times in which a woman um, has been uh, ordained a deacon, a deaconess. Um, but those are very, very extreme, far and in between uh, times. Uh, priests can be married in the Orthodox Church as long as they're married before they're ordained. But if a priest gets ordained before he's married, uh, then he can never marry, and monks never marry. And monks that become priests are called hieromonks. So the main difference between the priest and the bishop, according to, the, to Chrysostom, St. John Chrysostom, is that the latter ordains the former. A bishop is ordained by at least two other bishops, and the office of the bishop is restricted to unmarried priests, chaste priests or widows, and ecclesiastical custom from the seventh century up to this day. The bishop, the priest, and the deacon constitute the three degrees of the higher rank of priesthood, and it is a mistake to consider the degree of a priest and deacon in the lower rank of the clergy, as is the lower degree of the reader, etc. So when a person is going to be a priest, ordained a priest by the Orthodox Bishop in the Orthodox Church, he's first uh, ordained a reader or an acolyte. And then later on, he's ordained a subdeacon. Then later on, he's ordained a deacon. These are the orders of the priesthood. No one is just ordained a priest straight up. Uh, monks can be ordained priests, whether they've gone to seminary or not. It's up to the bishop who he uh, chooses how God's Holy Spirit works. But most priests uh, either trained in the monastery or they went through a seminary. And everyone, uh, be, anyone, uh, man that's a priest is someone who went through the holy orders by the bishop was ordained subdeacon, then deacon, then priest. So I think we're going to stop here, and then we'll get on the authority and reading of the Bible, the teachings and beliefs. So may God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.